on BBC Radio 5 Sports Extra. Welcome to Singapore. The sun has set since FP1 and the lights have come on around the 4.9 kilometre Marina Bay street circuit. It is dazzling as it winds its way through the streets of the city and we are getting ready for FP2, the second practice session ahead of what is hopefully going to be an exciting Singapore Grand Prix on Sunday. The crowds are starting to fill up the grandstands. I'm down here in the pit lane having a little look out over across the start finish straight and the fans are all trying to get a glimpse of the drivers as they get ready for this second practice session. It was Charles Leclerc who led the way in FP1 for Ferrari. Can they do the same in this second practice session? People thinking they might be the ones to beat this weekend. I'm Rosanna Tennant and joining me in the commentary box is Harry Benjamin, our lead commentator and former McLaren mechanic Mark Priestley. Harry, it looks impressive this circuit under the lights, doesn't it? And it's a, a tricky one to get right. The drivers have had a bit of a, a chance to have a little look and exploration out there in FP1, but FP2 this is a bit more representative, isn't it now, to what we're going to have in qualifying and come come race day on Saturday, uh, Sunday. Absolutely, yeah, the uh, the sun has set, as you say, the lights have come on to illuminate uh, well, just over 4.9 kilometres this track, that's just over 3 miles you've got 12 left-hand corners 7 to the right, actually reduced the amount of corners last year with uh, a bit of reworking uh, between what is now turns 14 and 16 we got rid of a couple of corners due to some building work going on in the Singapore uh, area so now we have uh, an additional straight with a bit of a kink in it and that's actually now a new DRS zone so four DRS zones to contend with which will hopefully increase overtaking what's more turns 3 9 10 12 14 17 all resurfaced <laughs> as well so I mean <laughs> not almost all the corners but some of them I know. have been resurfaced so uh, much smoother so evolution's already high with it, with the circuit in terms of speed ramping up uh, with every every practice session but the other thing is track temperature changes as well so make tire prep is going to be absolutely crucial getting the right brightness on the dash having the right helmet visor all this kind of stuff plays into uh, into effect for a night race yeah, it's exciting stuff, isn't it? So we've had a little bit of a gap between FP1 and FP2. And Mark, what would the mechanics and engineers have been doing? As Harry said, there's a lot of learning that goes on during FP1. What do they change then between these two practice sessions? So what can they change? Well, in theory, they can change anything at this point. So the, the sort of park ferme rules, the restrictions that come into play once the cars roll out the garage for qualifying, that only happens from qualifying onwards. So today, they can change whatever they like. But actually, in FP1, because the circuit was in the daylight, the temperatures are different as Harry said there was less learning around absolute performance of the car and much more about data collection so a lot of the cars had things like aero rakes big sort of sensor arrays on the back of the car collecting valuable data so all of those things of course will come off they will do a full debrief of drivers and look through the data they've collected and then they're able to make whatever changes they feel necessary to just make improvements to the car over the the break between the two sessions the danger with a weekend like this is because the environment is changing so much going from day into night which the rest of the weekend of course will be held in certainly the competitive sessions will be at night you don't want to get too lost in what you learnt this morning and base your your changes your mechanical changes too heavily on that because then as the environment changes and temperatures change you could find yourself a little bit lost or a little bit distracted so of course they all know that that's always part of the process here at Singapore but it's a really interesting weekend a little bit different to many of the others yeah, the sun has set, but it doesn't get cooler by any stretch. Well, maybe a couple of degrees, but it's still 29 degrees. Very hot and very humid. Uh, we've had a little bit of action between FP1 and FP2. Uh, Max Verstappen was called to the stewards. That was because he used a swear word in the press conference yesterday. So he had to go and see them at 7 o'clock local time. And they've decided that because he used that word in a press conference, he is now obligated to accomplish some work of public public interest. It remains to be seen what that work will be, but that's the outcome of that. And we've also had some news from McLaren in the break as well. Um, I'm sure you'll have heard there's been a bit of chat about their rear wing, whether it moves. We saw some footage during the Azerbaijan Grand Prix of perhaps some fluctuation, some movement uh, at the rear of Oscar Piastri's car and, and Lando Norris's car, of course, the McLaren's. Um, and McLaren have issued um, this. I'm going to read it out. They say that whilst our back and rear wing complies with the regulations 
passes all FIA deflection tests. McLaren are proactively offered to make some minor adjustments to the wing. Following our conversations with the FIA, we would also expect the FIA to have similar conversations with other teams in relation to the compliance of their rear wings. Now, my first thought was, oh, hang on, are they going to have to take a rear wing off now for FP2? But, Mark, I reckon this is probably a wing that we wouldn't see now again until Vegas, if they're talking about the Baku wing, because that was a low downforce spec wing. Yeah, exactly right. And that's, of course, on those, those low downforce tracks like Baku, where top speed is absolutely king. That's where it has the most benefit. The idea being that on the upper flap on the rear wing, the, the part of the DRS flap that opens in those conditions, in regular conditions, just the outboard edges of that, at the lower side of that upper flap, were starting to deflect upwards at high speed, sort of almost opening up a little gap on either side of the wing. And of course what that does is it dumps a bunch of drag as the air is able to pass through that gap, meaning the car can then reach an even higher top speed than it otherwise would. It's really valuable at a place like Baku, nowhere near as much here where it's all about you want the downforce because it's such a tight and twisty track so yes the, the, the bit that was left out from that little statement from McLaren was exactly when they were uh, going to be made to make these changes uh, and exactly what they'll be but effectively it's a tricky one because flexible bodywork the idea of flexible aerodynamic surfaces is banned in the regulations but it's a really tricky subject because all bodywork flexes at some point you know nothing's so rigid that it can't move at all otherwise it would break and that's always been the conversation that's happened between teams and the FIA how much is okay to allow these things to flex they have a series of set tests where they take uh, loadings from particular points on the wing McLaren and everyone else right now completely complies with those this is a new area of flex that no one's exploited before therefore there's no test to prove it being illegal that means they had to get through Baku it was never a problem but together with the FIA they have now agreed to make some changes at some point moving forward forward. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see if the FIA do have those similar conversations with other teams in relation to the compliance of their rear wings, as McLaren suggests, in their communications. Right, well, we've got a green light at the end of the pit lane. The drivers have piled out onto the track. We've got a mixture of tyres, Red Bull drivers opting for the hard tyre, uh, and the others that have passed me by, including the Ferraris, on the medium tyre. So uh, a couple of different run programmes going on, Harry, but it's time for FP2, so I'm going to hand it over to you up in the commentary box. Thank you very much, Rosanna Tennant. We will check back in with you throughout the course of free practice two which is very much underway and for those who want to do a sync up it's 57 minutes and 28 27 26 minutes remain as the sun has set the lights come on and illuminate this 4.9 kilometer just over three mile track and here's Verstappen <laughs> Uh, my radio button gets stuck. Okay, copy that. Verstappen with a little bit of a laugh and uh, a radio button getting a little bit stuck for him. He's just making his way very slowly through turns 16 and 17, perhaps gearing up for a lap. Uh, just to bring you up to speed then with how everything looks in the standings as we, uh, well, arrive at round 18 of the Formula One calendar in this longest season ever. And we still don't know where the championship is going to go but this is how it looks at the moment in the drivers Max Verstappen does still lead with a sizable gap 59 points the gap between himself and Lando Norris then Charles Leclerc within 20 points of Lando Norris in third Piastri fourth and Carlos Sainz rounds out the top five and over in the constructors championship well that fight is definitely on a three-way battle at the front McLaren lead the way having taken the lead in Baku last week they have 476 points to their name that is a gap of 20 to Red Bull and then Ferrari are not far behind either Mercedes and Aston Martin a little bit on their own in fourth and fifth then comes a really nice battle for the lower half of the constructors field RB currently leading that in sixth they are only five points ahead of Haas who are only 13 points ahead of Williams who jumped Alpine last time out with a double points finish and Alpine are only three points behind and then comes Sauber 10th and last still no points on the board in what is proving to be uh, a, a pretty woeful season for the, the Swiss based outfit who will have one more year of Sauber before they become Audi and Mark Priestley I want to ask you a question that has been relayed to me through social media and uh, has specifically asked for your answer. Okay. This is from Alex, a question for Mark. Given that he's been a McLaren mechanic, what's it like to be 
in a team that is leading the Constructors' Championship, that is fighting for a Constructors' title at this point in the season? Uh, well, it's great, is the first thing. Uh, thanks for asking the question, Alex. It's a, it's a, it's a great feeling because it immediately, and this is what uh, I know everyone at McLaren is feeling right now, it's, it's the reward for all of the hard work that's got in for actually not just this season, but for years building up to this point. So that's the first thing. The second thing that comes with it is a huge amount of attention. And you're well aware of that. There are eyeballs on you and what you do, on the decisions that are made, whether that's from the pit wall or in the garage, your pit stops are being analysed differently. Everything feels like it's being scrutinised to a, a higher degree. And of course, that comes with a, a bunch of pressure. You know, you, you cannot afford to make mistakes. And if you do make a mistake now that you're leading the championship, that you're a forerunner in this sport, you know that it's not going to go unnoticed. Whereas if you're midfield, if you're towards the back of the pack, you can kind of get away with the occasional little slip up here and there. You can't do that at the front. So I think that there's a sort of, it's a, it's a two-way street. You're really pleased and happy that you're up there and everybody wants to be fighting at the front it brings a whole new level of motivation and interest in a, in a race weekend where you go there knowing you can win you can come away with a big prize but the flip side is it comes with a huge amount of pressure and people watching every single move you make but on top of that though obviously at this point in the season the team and those members within it are thinking in all the ways you described but to come to Singapore and so often for so many years maybe Qatar now rivals it but the conditions are intense it is hot and humid how do you deal with that you know as a team member we know the drivers get all the cool systems they need as Fernando Alonso threads the needle literally between uh, about three moving roadblocks of car on his approach to turn seven manages to find a way through in the end traffic management is going to be crucial across the weekend into qualifying but how did you deal with the heat and, and sometimes the heavy rain that comes down yeah it, it can be really tough and um, you know in the mid 2000s I think Formula One I think actually led by McLaren really started to embrace this idea of human and performance not just being restricted to the driver so every single member of the team now gets that level of focus a sort of nutrition plan a physical training regime you know sleep management jet lag preparation all of these things and of course hydration over a weekend like this become massively important so as a team doctor at most of these operations now specifically tasked with looking after the people that work in that garage and it's important because if you don't people do drop and I've seen it happen many many times people collapse people have issues if they don't manage to stay hydrated and it, it seems really obvious just chuck a bit of water down your neck every now and again the reality is you're in a very intense weekend there's often not a lot of time particularly if something's gone wrong the pressure's on it's really simple and really easy to not drink water because you feel like you rushed off your feet someone being there to make sure you do at regular intervals and, and even putting uh, you know salts and, and things in your water to make sure you absorb that hydration better is massively important. It's a huge part of what is now a team performance um, directive. Absolutely. Hamilton on the radio saying traction is very bad. He had those issues as well in free practice one. Alex Albon, the Williams, is uh, flying in uh, that car at the moment. The DRS is open as he uh, brakes for turn 16. A quick right-hander followed by arcing your way through 17 into the left then it's a short straight before you stamp on the brake lightly into the double left-hander that finishes off a lack and goes within two tenths of Charles Leclerc Albon up into second Charles Leclerc currently fastest with a 132.7 Albon two tenths back both on the medium tyres and actually only three and a half tenths back from Albon is uh, Colin Pinto on the hard tyre so uh, a good lap opening stint at least from the Argentine driver as Ricardo goes for so lap time's changing all the time. Just to bring you, uh, we talked about temperature and uh, at the moment air temperature about 30 degrees. Track temperature 33.4 degrees, but the humidity is about 74%. And uh, well, that will only could get worse actually throughout the weekend. Yeah, and that is one of those issues we were just talking about there. From a human being perspective, it's really difficult. If you've ever been on holiday to places like this in the world, you know how sort of overwhelming it can be. It's easy when you're sitting on a sun lounger to just absorb that and take it in and kind of relax and 
throw a drink down your neck, uh, you know, and take it in. But when you're in the, in the intensity of working like this, wearing the team kit, particularly when it comes to race day, you've got your pit stop overalls on, it's hot and that really saps your energy. So, yeah, it's tough on both the machinery, on the drivers and everybody in the pit lane as well. Uh, the one thing I would say about lap times, because the circuit is evolving so quickly here, the lap times are going to continue to tumble. This is the first session, as we talked about earlier on, that's kind of representative in the, the sort of conditions we're likely to see qualifying and then the race happening. And so this is the really the first time where people are starting to look at real performance of their car, starting to work towards qualifying trim and race run preparation to understand just how their car works in these conditions for when it really matters later in the weekend. Yeah, and everyone out there at the moment, with the exception of Sergio Perez, who actually a few moments ago, Mark, we saw had a little skirmish in the pit lane exit where he came round, uh, well, the, because the pit lane exit curves round turn one, the left-hander, so you do take turn one, but right on the inside. Mm. He had a Mercedes in front of him, very slow, and that course, well, let's hear from Verstappen first. Yeah, I think the grip and uh, long speed is the uh, front and rear. No grip in the low speed front and rear from Max Verstappen in the Red Bull. Uh, but just to finish off his teammate, that meant Perez had to cross the white line at the pit exit, which he is now uh, under investigation for. Uh, well, actually, I'd say he could be given a black and white flag, uh, rather, for failing to follow the race directors in, uh race director's instructions but that's a bit harsh well yeah it's a little warning and i guess that's triggered automatically by a system somewhere but i think if a steward actually takes the time to look at that they'll realize that he had nowhere else to go really um just to quickly pick up on what verstappen said no grip on his car front or rear he is on the hard tire now you know when we come to qualifying especially it's going to be the soft tire of course they're going to use for that it's the one that heats up most quickly gets the most grip down onto the racetrack the hard tire is much more difficult to build temperature in even on a very you know hot track like this is hamilton so it looks like we're struggling with traction turns seven eight nine thirteen yeah i got no rear end pit. So Hamilton seems to be really struggling with grip as well out there, as you, as you just said, particularly on the rear end. But, I mean, this has been a, a regular pattern for Hamilton so far throughout the season. Is The setup just seems to be a bit night and day for him. He seems to either find a rhythm and then lose it by the time it comes to qualifying in the race. Yeah. Uh, and, that, and, he, and he doesn't seem to have an answer for it. No, I mean, if you, t if you look at the Mercedes versus, say, the McLaren, for example, the McLaren seems to have a sort of much bigger or wider operating window, i.e. the car comes alive and generates the grip that the drivers need in a much greater span of conditions. So on different racetracks, at different temperatures and different weather conditions, it seems to work pretty much everywhere. Now, if you've got a wider span of, of setup and of operation, you can afford to do different things with the way the car is, is balanced. If you've got a narrower window of operation, you've got to get it exactly right. And it's kind of what we've seen at Red Bull in the hands of Max Verstappen. He's found it difficult to get into what is actually now a narrow window of operation for the Red Bull. I think Mercedes is very similar. The really sweet spot is to be where McLaren are, where you can afford to do various different things and you're still going to be there or thereabouts. Get it absolutely right, of course, and you catapult yourself right to the very front. But just outside of that, in a Mercedes, seems like it's actually a long way down the order. Well, on the flip side, you just heard a round of applause in the background. That was from the Williams garage for Alex Albon, who just went fastest, and both Williams are finding time. Albon on the medium tyre, a 1.32.2, now three tenths clear of Charles Leclerc. Franco Colapinto, who's out there on the hard tyre, seven tenths back from his teammate, sick. I mean, off the back of a fantastic run in Baku, double points finishes. The vindication already made clear for, for Colapinto replacing Sargent. It, it, it almost seems like this upgrade that they brought, what Zanvor that they brought in, they flicked a switch and, and Williams are, are looking strong. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And let's not forget, this is a completely different type of circuit to Baku. I know it's a street circuit, but Baku, very, very high speed down the, the, the latter half of the lap. You've really got to maximise that to get your lap time. Of course, the first part is a typical street circuit with 90 degree corners. This is a bit different. This is A, at night and under very different conditions and temperatures, but it's a street circuit all the way around. There are no really, really high speed sections. It's high speed for a street circuit. It's not a Monaco, but it's very different to Baku. Uh, okay. 
Hans Verstappen going off down at uh, turn seven on the exit of turn seven. We saw a few cars. There's a, uh, there's a curb there, the red and white curb, which uh, Alonso and Norris uh, both got perched up on with the uh, the wooden plank underneath the car sitting right on top of that, losing all grip and almost losing the rear end. That was what happened to those two drivers in FP1. But for Verstappen, it was just a simple case of not getting it turned in. Yeah, absolutely. has caught a few people out. Uh, just coming back to Williams, I think um, what's really nice to see is, first of all, Williams are a much-loved team. So whenever they have a decent result, it seems to be a popular one. But actually, this is underpinned by a lot of work going on in the background. James Vowles has come to that team, and he's trying to build something long-term. This is not just about maximising the 2024 season. It's about building something that will work and be fine-tuned in 25, so that in 26, when the massive regulation change comes in, They've got Carlos Sainz, of course, joining the team next year. He's been convinced to join, by the way, by understanding what's going on in the background. If all of this starts to work the way James Vowles and the people at Williams expect and hope it will, they could genuinely be a, a force when the big shake-up comes in 26. It's really anyone's game at that point. So if they're building things in the right way now, it's got that longer-term future in mind. And I think before... We almost used to see, uh, and they've become Williams, uh, a bit of a Mercedes junior team, particularly with George Russell racing there. Yeah. It felt like it was a bit of a holding pattern for their young drivers. Valtteri Bottas. Valtteri well. Bottas before then, exactly that. And, and now, especially if we focus on the Colapinto assignment, he is a Williams Academy member. He was brought in by James Vowles into the Academy before he was even touted to be a replacement for, for Logan Sargent. So that on its own shows how much more independent they are now and wanting to stand on their own two feet and be seen as, as a four, as a major player again. Yeah, 100%. And to do that as an independent, which effectively they are, they're not assigned to a major automotive manufacturer. Yes, they take their power units from Mercedes, but they are an independent team. They don't want to be seen as a junior team to anybody. They want to be able to stand on their own two feet. So much history and legacy at that team. They deserve to be up the front. You know, the, the, the history books say that Williams should always be somewhere in the mix. They spent a lot of time towards the back, sort of in the doldrums in recent times. They are now building towards getting back to the front. I think it's great. Uh, speak of Franco Colapinto, and uh, perhaps that's uh, a bit of a rookie mistake, just coming down the pit lane. And to be fair, they're both wearing dark blue shirts, but he dro drove into the Alpine pit garage, who are waiting for one of the Alpine drivers before he's uh, briskly told to make <laughs> his way through and head to the next one down where the Williams team are waiting for him. And you can actually see a few smiles from some of the Williams mechanics there. Just giving him a wave. No, we're over here, Franco. Next one down. <laughs> it's pretty embarrassing. That That's the sort of thing that you will never live down. The other drivers will make sure you never forget but many a great driver has done it i remember lewis hamilton doing that when he moved to mercedes so no one is uh, no one's no one can escape that permanently that, that can happen to the best colapinto if he continues the momentum he's on do you think we'll see him next year perhaps at Sauber? Well, there is only one seat left available, and it is that, that second seat at Sauber alongside Hulkenberg, and he seems to be in the frame, James Val, saying he's actively talking to Sauber and, and Audi about p placing him there for the future. Why not? He's in the best position. You know, there's lots of talk about other drivers, like um, Bortoletto, for example, from F2, being a potential uh, driver alongside Hulkenberg, but the guy who's got the best opportunity is the guy that's in a car right now, because he's got a chance, like Oli Behrman had when he's had his opportunities at Ferrari and then at Haas last week they've got the opportunity in front of the world to show what they can do and he's grasping that with both hands so yeah why not well we were discussing an FP1 and we're still all ears about drivers who came in mid-season uh, and then did so well got a seat the following year uh, so uh, do send uh, send those in people like Nick De Vries of course and uh, you go back to Michael Schumacher back in 1991 or Sebastian Vettel in 2007 so if you've got any send the main hashtag bbcf1 we always like to, to be surprised the niche the better uh, right 41 minutes and 25 24 23 seconds remain of free practice two charles leclerc is currently fastest half a second clear of albon then it's russell sonoda and signs the top five and in the pit lane it's rosanna tennant <laughs> what an introduction. Thank you very much. I do try. Uh, do you know what? Well, I know you do, and you do blooming well. Um, I was just walking along the pit lane, and you tried to sort of almost uh, numb yourself to the heat and the humidity, but I suddenly realised it's feeling so much hotter. And I know that sounds ludicrous, because it's got 
like sort of dark and the sun has gone down and Are you, you might expect too to hard, get cooler. Yeah, I am. <laughs> Obviously, I need to have a lie down. I'm not quite sure where would be safe to do so in the pit lane. Um, but yeah, it is. It's, it's feeling a lot hotter suddenly. Uh, but look, the fans are here in the grandstands. They're enjoying what they're seeing. Um, not totally full, but come race night, I'm sure it will be. Um, have you got yes, one of those mini fans really that you could hold? The mini handheld fans? <laughs> That's about all I have. Just one mini fan. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> do you know what? I was promised one by my brother and he hasn't come up with the goods. I thought I was going to get a mini Shocking. fan. You throwed him right under the, the bus there. Sessions. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I was hoping for that to cool me down because it is just sweltering. And look, I'm wearing, you know, I'll paint the picture. I'm wearing a dress. It's linen. It's from a well-known supermarket. But the mechanics are in the garage working so hard and the drivers are in the cockpit i don't know how they don't quite frankly lose the pot because it is so uh, sweltering i mean the thing is rosanna when you are in the garage wearing all of that gear the team uniform and as i said on race day you've got your, your fire suit on and everything else with the the fireproof underwear the whole shebang you are dressed up effectively like a driver is you kind of like you said you have to sort of somehow block that out and it actually it's, it's amazing how quickly it becomes normal so you know you can go from being hot to crazy hot and actually the difference doesn't feel so bad how was that last lap all over the place Perez is asked, how was that last lap? He replies with, all over the place. And at the moment, well, the two Red Bulls on the hard tyre, Perez down in 14th, 1.6 seconds off. Verstappen behind him down in 15th. And that last lap around for Sergio Perez was a, uh, a 130. Well, that can't be right. Oh, yeah, well, 130. Yes, 133.3 down in uh, 14th. Whereas uh, the fastest lap or last lap around for Carlos Sainz was in the 130 yards, although he he is on the medium tyre, so how about we compare it to Yuki Tsunoda, who's on the hard, who is in a 132.5, so Perez slower uh, than Tsunoda on the hard tyre last lap around. Yeah, not yet comfortable for either Red Bull, and I don't just base that on the lap time, but the feedback and the comments coming from both are that they're just not happy. They haven't got the grip that they need. Max Verstappen saying earlier on, got no grip front or rear. You know, quite often, if you've got a lack of grip at the front or the rear, you can sort of dial that out through setting up you know you can change the characteristics of the car by changing some of the settings when you've just got a, a general lack of grip you know that's an even bigger problem you don't quite know where to start because changing big chunks of, of mechanical things now can introduce all sorts of other problems when really and particularly on a street circuit you want a nice clean smooth weekend where each lap and each session you're just building towards what will hopefully be your ultimate lap time on qualifying making massive changes just means that every time you're going in with a bit of an unknown and then you've got to figure it out during the session whereas really you want to be creeping towards the barriers on every one of these courses just getting faster and faster and faster and continue peak on on Saturday at qualifying and then again in the race a long way to go yet though we already got we've got 37 minutes still to go in this second practice session so to have problems at this point is not the end of the world and that was the very point of the sessions is it of course to try and find out how to get the best out of your cars Perez has just been wheeled back into the garage, Mark. He was on that hard tyre, and as he's been wheeled back in, Max Verstappen's gone out on the soft tyre. So that's interesting that Red Bull have decided to go for that softer tyre, the softest compound of all the C5. Radio. Okay, that was Hamilton on the radio, Rosanna, just saying massive understeer, uh, understeer still. Try saying that quickly. Uh, and uh, <laughs> when well, you talk about the softs, Albon's out there now, fastest of anybody in the middle sector on the soft tyre, Rosanna. Yeah, and we heard understeer problems for Max Verstappen earlier on as well. So a couple of drivers struggling with that one. But I'm really interested with the tyre choice for the rest of the weekend. Last year, we saw some of the drivers opting for the C5, the softest tyre, the red uh, wall tyre, because they wanted a bit more grip off the start. Do you think we're going to see that again this year? And I'm interested by the Red Bulls running that hard tyre uh, now and now opting to switch to the, the soft. Yeah, well, the, the reason people are switching to the soft uh, at this point is they do need to get at least a, a reading on how fast their car will go in ultimate conditions so with the softest tyre low on fuel and that's of course a little bit of reading into what they might be able to do in qualifying so that, that does make some sense in terms of the race it's definitely a one stop race um, it would take something extraordinary like a, a safety car or even a, a red of flag of which there is a 100% chance there you go and the reason for it is that let's hear Russell first I have lip hope <laughs> 
<laughs> that was Russell saying, I have limp home. <laughs> and what he means by that is a little bit like in your road car, if you have a, a technical problem with the engine or something like that, the ECU will kick in and switch it into what is effectively a safe mode so you can drive it slowly back to the pits without making any further damage. That's what's happening to Russell. In terms of the race, one-stop strategy, A, because it's very difficult to overtake around a street circuit, but B, because the pit lane or the pit lane loss time for making a pit stop is around 28 seconds. Now, that is a lot. Most circuits are nearer to the 20-second mark. But here, because it's such a tight uh, pit lane, the pit lane speed limit is dropped from 80 kilometers an hour to 60 kilometers an hour. That means the total time it takes to get into the pits, make your pit stop and get out the other end, is much greater. Therefore, you want to be in there as, as little time as possible. So therefore, one stop. So making the one stop at your race strategy is going to be uh, pretty much what everyone's going to do. What they're trying to figure out now is how well do these soft tires work, A, over the one lap in the, at the qualifying trip, and B, have they got enough life in them? I, do they degrade quick, too quickly to make it actually a starting race tyre, as you said, Rosanna, like we saw last time out? Yeah, so that's what they're going to be doing on that soft tyre now. So we should see uh, quite a few laps on that soft, softer tyre. Uh, we just had Lewis Hamilton coming back into the pits. I thought it was going to be George Russell with that limp home um, mode message. But has he managed to get it going? I don't have a driver tracker, unfortunately, he, down here still going in the around. pit lane. <laughs> and, he, and he's on a quick lap at the moment. He's just gone fastest of anybody in the middle sector. So I wonder if he's accidentally flicked a switch and uh, it's just gone into limp home mode by accident. But he's hurtling now down towards in that new DR zone towards the braking zone of turn 16 slings it into the right then it arcs round to the left hander you go underneath at the bridge and then it's a short dart to the final double left hander almost flat out we'll get there across the weekend round turn 19 to see off the lap and well fastest of anybody a 131 488 tenth and a half quicker than alex album so there it is there's the secret stick it in limp home mode as for your preparation lap and then bang in an absolute flyer he's just been topped by oscar piastri in the McLaren. Indeed, but can Lando Norris do anything about it? He's fastest in the middle sector and fastest in the final sector and by a seven tenths of a second. Lando Norris to the top of the timings with 33 minutes and 27, 26, 25 seconds on the clock. It's McLaren 1 and 2 with FP2. Max Verstappen now makes his way round the final corner. He can only manage eight, a 132.0. We look at Charles Leclerc, who's also going quickly in the first sector. Had a bit hectic. Yeah, not the best prep. That was Russell on the radio. Well, not the best prep. Well, it was half decent until the McLarens came calling. And indeed, Ricardo has now also dropped in. And Sonoda, the two RBs, going quite well, actually, so far. Yeah, and Charles Leclerc on an absolute flyer as well. Fastest, than, fastest of anybody in the first two sectors. He's just coming round to close out the lap now through the final corner and onto the start finish straight and he'll cross the timesheets not quite enough to beat uh, Lando Norris's McLaren but it's very very close less than a tenth in it so we're, we're very much in these uh, qualifying tyre simulation runs right now yeah. right yeah that's what's happening at the moment and that, ugh, look, less than a tenth between Norris and uh, Charles Leclerc uh, this is the sound of Lewis Hamilton oh, just really struggling with that Mercedes trying to get it turned in and just Listen to this. Oh, can't quite hear it there, but the rear just looking all out of sorts for Hamilton in that Mercedes. Yeah, when you when you see these sort of on boards, oh, Alex Albon just clipped the wheel there with his right wheel, right rear. It's not uncommon around here. The, the lap time comes from being incredibly close to these walls. Alex Albon just getting a little bit too close, taking a little bit of the paint from the wall with him on his, uh, the outside of his right rear tyre. Um, yeah, when you look at a driver up close from either an off-board or even an on-board shot, as we got from Lewis Hamilton a moment ago, you see him soaring at the wheel coming through the corner the fastest way around any racetrack is smoothly it's to turn in at the right point the car you hope will then bite and grip you'll be able to turn in one smooth movement through the corner on the way out you gradually put the throttle down and you bury it eventually and, and off you go anything outside of that where you're soaring at the wheel back and forward having to lift on or off the throttle pedal being on or off the brakes that just means you're slower and that's what we're seeing from Lewis at the moment he hasn't got a nicely balanced car therefore he can't drive it fast and smooth which is the key well he does love it round here wins in 2009 2014 2017 2018 for Lewis Hamilton 
but uh, the Mercedes at the moment just doesn't seem to be very comfortable out on track. We in the body runs will get the long runs later. I touch the wall, exit of turn 14, not a big touch, but a slight one. Please check later. Copy. That was Charles Leclerc there saying he's touched the wall slightly on the exit of turn 14. Doesn't seem too alarmed by that, but uh, asks the team to check the data. Joe Guan Yu's just done a, a fairly tidy lap for the Sauber driver, both Bottas and Joe within a few hundreds of a, ten, a hundreds of a second of each other, actually down in 14th and 15th. Rosanna. Harry, you're talking about Mercedes struggling to get the setup right. George Russell's just come into the pit lane and he had a little uh, front wing adjust. The mechanics were there ready with the little adjusters, all automated, of course, these days. They set the, the target on their machine and then they go to work when he comes into the pit box. So obviously struggling to get the setup right. He's gone straight back out, so it was just a quick stop. And uh, we've got Charles Claire in. And he's out, so obviously nothing doing with that little touch that he spoke about on the radio, but coming in maybe just for a quick over by the mechanics and that's down there to Lewis Hamilton on the soft tyre heading back out as well so little ins and outs for the drivers at this point of FP2 not wanting to waste any time being in the pit lane when they could be out on track thanks Rosanna Perez has come across the line on his uh, soft tyre run can only manage seventh fastest in that Red Bull eight and a half tenths off the leading time of Lando Norris yeah, and, you know, that might be what most of us expected coming into the weekend. It's, it is still early, and, and there's always a caveat with lap times in any of these practice sessions, but we are on soft tyre runs, so effectively a sort of qualifying-based simulation that's going on here for pretty much all the drivers. Whilst we've got Norris at the front, we've got Leclerc, we've got Sainz, we've got uh, Piastri up there, the usual players. It's the two Red Bulls that are a long way down on that same soft tyre doing their own version of what is a qualifying run. Now, we often see, particularly at Red Bull, they do turn engines up on a Saturday from that point onwards for the rest of the weekend. So there's always a hike in performance when it comes to the, the, the really meaningful sessions. But they are still struggling in comparison. So this is a circuit that's never really suited them in recent years. I mean, even last year when they had a really dominant car, this was the one they struggled at. Maybe we're going to see something similar again. Quite possibly. 28 minutes and 32, 31, 30 seconds remain of free practice two. Uh, just a couple of uh, late entries on hashtag BBCF1 for drivers who came in mid-season and then got a seat with another team full-time the following year. Will Stevens, yeah, 2014 Caterham final race. But both their drivers sort of left because the team, I think, was, was about to fold anyway. But then yeah. he did come back full-time with uh, Manor the following year. Good knowledge, yeah. I hadn't thought of that one. So well done to Roxy for that one. Thank you. And I, I'm sorry, I can't find the name, but somebody did suggest Roman Grosjean. That's his name first. We need to work on the front left and a bit on the brakes. And good job on the delta. Is that sarcastic? No, no. You are, you are good. You are good, man. Yuki Sonoda and his engineer then were being told to work on the brakes and uh, <laughs> asking if that was sarcastic. <laughs> He's talking about working on getting the temperatures right. So front left, I think he said, just got to work in bringing the temperature up on that particular tyre ahead of really going for it as he starts the lap. Same on the brakes, a little bit low on temperature, I imagine. Could be they're a little bit high, but I imagine they're a little bit low. So just do some work in building the temperature up so that they're in the optimum window when you start your flying lap. Roman Grosjean came in to replace, well, as, well, as a result of what happened in Singapore in 2008, replaced, <laughs> uh, well, not quite, but replaced Nelson Piquet Jr. Yeah, that's another good but, one. But didn't, I, I don't know if I'm allowing it, though, because he wasn't brilliant, and then he did. He went back to GP2 the next year. I was just going to say, he was also replaced himself. Yeah, so that's <laughs> another replaced, a mid-season replacement he was replaced. But then he came back in 2012. I don't know how you want to play that well, one. You are a harsh taskmaster. You only gave me half a point for Max Verstappen earlier, who I think stepped up to Red Bull mid-season. Full-time drive came off the back of that. Absolutely nailed it. So, I, uh, yeah, I'm not disputing that. In my head, it's drivers who w had not already been in Formula One, well, who, sorry, were, who were being catapulted in. Didn't clarify the rules, did well, you? Well, I thought the Colo Pinto example was enough to, to demonstrate that. <laughs> Clearly not. Well, thank you, everybody, who got in touch. We've had Debris, Schumacher, Vettel, Kobayashi, Kubica, Esteban Ocon, Daniel Ricciardo, uh, and, uh, well, quite a few there that get their chance. So perhaps Frank 
Nico Colapinto will be the next one to add on that list. Already, definitely a good mid-season replacement. But will he be around next year? We shall see. James Bowers and Williams looking after him as his teammate Alex Albon comes across the line. Can't improve on his overall lap time. Stays ninth down in what is really a bit of a home race for Alex Albon, the, uh, the London-born Thai driver racing under a Thai license. And, of course, we're not too far away from Thailand here in Singapore. Lewis Hamilton then wrestling the Mercedes around the final corner. What has he got? 11th place, a 131.7 on his soft tyre running. Yeah, and still didn't look happy. I mean, that's the most telling thing. The lap time speaks for itself, but he's not happy. You can see him again, once again, just making corrections on the wheel, even through the high speed last couple of left-hand corners to close out the lap. Making small corrections, that's, that's not the fastest way around a lap. So they've got some work to do. And of course, this is what all of the teams will look at. They'll be running simulations from back at base, back in Brackley uh, and Bricksworth for Mercedes, where the driver in the loop simulator will be running all night long, trying things out, trying different setups on the car, with the driver sat in there, giving real-time feedback, and of course looking at data, with a view to then being able to transfer those settings, hopefully to make an improvement, when it comes to FP3, the next practice session tomorrow. Well, we shall see. There's uh, a little bit of debris out on track. I think it's a bit of uh, advertising hoarding. Uh, a little bit of uh, the yes, the advertising from the side of the track, which was being collected by Franco Colapinto in the first place. He hit the wall very lightly and that's ripped off a little piece of the sticker and uh, just uh, on that was on the racing line I think before Alex Albon drove over it and shoved it out of the way as Oscar Piastri just seeing a replay what happened to the Australian I think it was just him running wide over that big yeah. curb um, that's caught quite a few people out well, at this stage of the game, 24 minutes remaining, seeing the soft tyres running, a couple of uh, drivers actually going for a second run-in as well. We heard Tsunoda being uh, given some tips uh, to try and get the most out of his soft tyres. Uh, let's bring in the BBC's F1 correspondent, Andrew Benson, for the first time this weekend. Um, hello, Andrew, how are you? Oh, hang on, Andrew, hold on, Hamilton Radio. Yes, I believe I'm here. Okay, Lewis, that's P11. So Lewis not happy with uh, that last run as he comes into the pits. Right, Andrew Benson, what have you observed so far from this free practice two session? Well, um, first of all, in your little game about drivers, Harry, it's oh, yes. quite a big one. Gilles, Gilles Villeneuve came in mid-season in 1977 at McLaren and Silverstone, impressed everybody, it was in a Ferrari by the end of the year and was a permanent Ferrari driver in 1978 and went on to become one of the legends of the sport, of course. I was, I was letting you have that one. I was waiting for you to come up with it. <laughs> Only you, Andrew. Well done, mate. <laughs> yeah, um, it's an interesting session, isn't it? You know, Norris and Leclerc at the top, followed by Sainz. You know, you know, that makes sense, although there's a very, very big gap between Norris and Leclerc and then Sainz in third place. He's six tenths behind those two, separated by five hundreds. But what's Yuki Tsunoda doing in fourth place? The Mercedes are obviously struggling. The Red Bulls are obviously struggling. We kind of expected the Red Bulls to struggle. Um, but, uh, you know, Fernando Alonso, I don't think, has done a lap on the soft tyres, has he? Um, anyway, it's a really mixed up order, apart from that top three. Um, so uh, I, I can't imagine tomorrow that Yuki Tsunoda will qualify fourth. But um, lots to get our teeth into later on, I think. Certainly is. We'll, we'll check back in with you for the long run data as well when that comes through. I believe Alonso has done a soft tyre run. He's just come across the line again on the soft tyres. Improved slightly. Still about a second off Norris, though. Uh, Alonso down in 12th, just behind Lewis Hamilton. But as, as Andrew says, Mark, the, the two RBs, Sonoda in fourth. But Ricardo is in sixth as well. And, and is only about a hundredth of a second behind Sonoda when it comes uh, to the gap it's really tight actually between well every, between third and eighth right now and actually the top ten with uh, Norris and Leclerc a little bit adrift at the front of the queue so uh, again the caveat is it's free practice we don't quite know fuel loads but can we say that's encouraging? Well, I think you can definitely say it's encouraging for RB to have both drivers up there is a, is a definite sign of, of where they are in comparison to everyone else right now. What typically happens, as I said, we do get certainly the top teams taking a step either overnight on a Friday with all the work that's gone on back at the factories but also even more so when you really turn either the, the technology up i.e. your engine but also the, the best drivers are able to bring a little bit extra when it really matters in the qualifying sessions and, and we would expect that to happen again tomorrow but I think 
on a street circuit like this, so much lap time comes from a driver having the confidence to be able to push very close to those walls. If you look at Lewis Hamilton, he's got no confidence in that car right now. So 11th place on the timesheets is largely representative of that. It may not even be, that's just the outright pace of his car. But as a, as a driver, he's got no confidence because of the instability. If he pushes to the limit, he doesn't know what's going to happen. If at the front end of the field, the very best drivers in the very best cars have that confidence, and that's where a large chunk of your lap time comes from. So if you can introduce confidence into the mix between now and qualifying, you could actually bring a massive amount of, of lap time with it. That's the voice of the former McLaren, McLaren mechanic, Mark Priestley, alongside myself, Harry Benjamin, and down in the pit lane, it's Rosanna Tennant. In need of a glass of water, or two. <laughs> I thought you were going to say a glass Please of wine. hydration. Well, that too, if you're offering. Um, I've just seen George Russell head out on the medium tyre, so Mercedes deciding to switch from... Is that radio? Or... It, it is. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> It's, a it's Gasly who found a little bit of traffic in the form of Sergio Perez's Red Bull coming through uh, well, what was the old Singapore sling. Uh, so again, traffic management is such a crucial thing around here right now. I'll have one of those as well if you're offering. Uh, here we go. <laughs> There's Carlos Sainz heading into the Ferrari pit box there. He's being hauled up onto the jacks and the tyres are being wrapped up nice and toasty <laughs> in the tyre blankets as well. But yes, George Russell out on the medium. So Mercedes deciding to try that tyre now. Um, not sure what that says about their plan for the rest of the weekend. I was having half a thought about the soft tyre lasting a little bit longer in Q3 and whether because of traffic and, um, you know, costing you time in Q3. Do you think that soft tyre is going to last anything more than a lap around this track? It's a really difficult one to know. I mean, it will last more than a, than a lap. Uh, they always last more than that. It's just about what lap time you lose as a result. Uh, it hit the wall pretty hard. It's loud and nice. And McLaren are out, ready to receive. Yeah, it's a Norris You're coming to the pits. What can you see, Rosanna? He's just going past me. I can't see anything hanging off the car. That's what I always look for first. <laughs> uh, don't laugh. Uh, but the mechanics are right there, as you'd imagine. Everyone having a little look. They're checking the rear right and the right-hand side of the car. Mechan mechanics crouching down, just brushing a bit of dust, maybe, off the, uh, the rims. He's still there. Engine's still running. Lights flashing at the back of the car. They've been trying to cool it down, of course, while he's stationary with those leaf blowers, blowing out the uh, liquid nitrogen. And he's on his way again. So hopefully nothing too serious for the McLaren team at this stage, uh, because you want to stay out there now. And that's exactly what he's going to do. He's heading back out onto the track. All right. Thanks, Rosanna. I mean, we have seen a couple of drivers have skirmishes with the walls. And, and if you do hit it sort of flat with your tyre, with your you can get away with it. I was just going to say, it's surprisingly common, you know, and I've been in the garage when drivers have come in and not even known they've hit the wall, and it's only when you take the tyres off the car and you realise there's paint all around the outside of the of the, uh, the sidewall of the tyre that you realise they've done it. So, yeah, as I said, the lap time comes from being as close as you can possibly get to the wall. So the slightest kiss is absolutely fine, and that shows a driver on the limit. It shows that you've got the best opportunity to maximise the quickest way around this track. But it doesn't take much to go just beyond that limit and you end up in all sorts of problems. We're just uh, listening to Lando Norris on board now. Coming through turns one and two, then through the left-hander of three. Oh, and there is a touch. Front right. Front right hits the wall at the exit of three. But in a way, the angle was fairly, you know, sort of sidewall on sidewall. Yeah, it was. I mean, it, for Lando himself to say that was pretty hard, I think it tells you that it was more than just a kiss. Um, but it was, as I say, pretty lateral loads. It was it was sidewall face of the wheel into the side, uh, into the flat face of the wall itself. So hopefully, and it looks like he has, because he's still running around the racetrack, he's got away with it. Well, still fastest, and uh, well, the man who has started the Grand Prix from pole five times, but uh, lost the lead on the first lap every time is Lando Norris. And, uh, well, ironic, wasn't it? I think in Baku, when he started all the way down the grid and actually had one of his better starts. That's right, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, let's see how he goes this weekend. But you know what? We talk so much, and rightfully so, about the fight at the front as Lando Norris embarks on a quick lap on the soft. So we'll keep you up to date with how it pans out. But I do just want to talk about Salva very briefly and we don't talk about them very often no. because they have zero points but you know what we were really harsh on them at the start of the year for their pit stops which were 
to be blunt, <laughs> terrible. Yes. In fact, I've got the numbers. On average, in the first three races, their pit stops were 14.23 seconds because they had some issues with their new their new mechanics that they were bringing in, not the people, the actual mechanisms of, of how they were yeah. going about their pit stop. But in the in Baku, their average was 2.4 seconds. What a turnaround. Yeah, it's right. It has been. It, and as you say, it was. It always looks like it's the people that are at fault. So whenever you watch a pit stop, because it's normally such a slick and fast, quite phenomenal operation to see happen in front of you. When it goes wrong, it could be spectacular. And it always looks... And I remember ever, you know, being in a pit stop, if something went wrong, I was always aware that you feel like you look like a right clown because you can imagine the sort of comedy music playing in the background to these clips that are going to undoubtedly find their way on the social media somewhere. But it, invariably, and it was the case with Salva, it wasn't the people, certainly not the people in the pit stop, it was this problem with the technology. They had a design error, if you like, and it took them a while to fix it. But what's come with that is they have updated that tech, they have brought in a development that's improved the problem they had now off the back of that they can start fine-tuning the process and the people involved in the pit stop and you're right they've done a wonderful job because to recover from that which takes a big knock in things like confidence you're starting on the back foot compared to everyone else in terms of your pit stop development they've got to a point now where they are right up there amongst the quickest in recent times yeah so you know a, a shout out where it's due for Salva absolutely how would you feel if you were in that team at the moment with, with where they are at currently with their on-track performances but also what the future holds for them as well as we do have a, a momentary yellow flag out in sector one but it's gone green again well you're you're obviously frustrated no one wants to be at the back and certainly not in a season when the order's shuffling around so much and people like Williams scoring big points last time out if you've still got zero points and you're the only team in which you're in that situation that's pretty brutal to take the, the flip side is you've got Audi coming in on the horizon. That means you're going to go from being a very small independent team to being a major automotive manufacturer coming into this sport with designs on winning the title. Now, it seems like there's a gulf between where they are now and what their ambitions hold. And actually, even, even Audi themselves reset their own expectations in terms of timeline for that. There's something with the brakes that is strange. I keep looking at the programming. So the signs just saying there's something with the brakes that is still strange, keeps locking them up. So signs uh, was complaining about that at the start of the session and an FP1 as well. Yeah, so there's a number of things that could be, but they will they will have to have a very close look at the data. To have not been at find the solution now is slightly strange, but anyway, I'm sure they'll get to the bottom of it. But yeah, Audi reset their own timeline expectations on when they think they might be in a position from, I think they initially set a three-year target, which seemed like a real tall order. Now it's sort of this undetermined time in the future. They still want to be world champions, but they don't want to put quite the same strict timeline on it. So you're in that organization, you're excited about what's coming, but so frustrated right now. And I think that's going to be one of the most difficult things because you need to be building now in the way that we talked about Williams building for the future so that when the big chance comes in 26, I can't overstate how big an opportunity that is for everybody in this sport. A total reset of the rules. Literally anybody doing a really good job could come out either on top or right up in the mix. Audi need to be one of those teams, but at the moment, it seems a mile away, doesn't it? So it's a difficult one to have the belief that you can get there even though you've got this big organization coming in you're going to start to question your own self-confidence at some point if you're Audi, who we know are, are weighing up that that driver lineup nico holkenberg is confirmed who goes alongside do you keep an experienced guy like Valtteri bottas or do you take a a, a punt on on a young gun I think taking a Valtteri Bottas is effectively like taking another Nico Hülkenberg for me. You've got the guy that's got the experience, that's there to sort of steady the ship, can give you some really good feedback based on that experience. Valtteri, for me, gives you another version of that. So for me, you take a young gun. Now, Bortoletto, who's a, a young driver in F2 right now, I think managed by Fernando Alonso, he's definitely been talked about as being in the frame. But as we touched earlier on, Franco Colapinto is in the box seat. He's on, a, on the racetrack right now. He's in a Formula One car and with a number of races to show what he can do. James Vowles is right behind him and talking to Audi about trying to get him that seat. So he could find himself with a really good opportunity that he certainly wasn't expecting to this level. And if he makes the most of it, which he started off doing very well in Baku last time out, he could find himself in a really good shot for that. And, and if you're Audi, there are definitely worse people you could look at taking. It feels like we're seeing a, a bit of a 
a real turnover at the moment when it comes to the, the experienced drivers yeah. meeting the ends of their careers because we've also got increased rumour this week about Daniel Ricciardo yeah. and whether he may well be out after this weekend or indeed replaced by Liam Lawson for next year. Well, I think there's two parts to that. We've seen a number of young rookies come in and take opportunities like Behrman and really do a good job. Lawson did a good job when he came in last year too. Um, we're seeing a, an influx of rookies into the championship next year. So the idea of taking a rookie is no longer seen as quite the risk it used to be. And the second big part of this is again coming back to this big regulation change of 26. You could stick a rookie in your car for 26, but that's that's a whole new set of car regulations, power unit, plus a new young driver. Or you could stick a young rookie in for 25, bed them in at the end of a stable set of regulations where the team understand fully their car and actually they can hit the ground running for 26 when it all changes and that is your big opportunity to do well. So I think that's the thinking up and down the pit lane right now. It makes a lot more sense today to put a rookie in than it might have done five years ago. Yeah, and I mean, on that, obviously 2026 is, is around the corner. Already all the teams are thinking about those regulation changes and, and of course the, the PU elements of it, which are so uh, integral. But in that fight for really the lower five teams, I'm going to be so fascinated by the dynamic that occurs there because actually, while you've got your Red Bulls, your Mercedes, your Ferraris, your McLarens, your, your big teams, the top, the top four, Aston Martin are going to have Adrian Newey, Sauber are going to have the might of Audi, Williams have made a huge investment, top driver like Carlos Sainz, 11 hires this year in the aero department, 13 in the design, they are rehauling Grove, their headquarters, RB, the junior of, of Red Bull, so get all the, the, the feedback from that, uh, then it kind of feels like Haas is in, in a bit of a, a, a sort of worrying boat on their own that might get left behind so that, that if you see what i'm trying to get Pass at in terms of the alpine. dynamic and alpine who might well even lose their the kind of independent constructor status if they do indeed ditch their engine program yeah i think you're absolutely right and look, for all the, the positive stories you just talked about there all those teams that are building towards that as we've already talked about at some length you can see why the opportunity is massive so for Alpine to be talking about ditching their engine program and going back to being a customer team, it feels like there's a little bit of disarray in the background of that team. It's the worst time those sorts of things could be happening. I mean, even look at Red Bull right now, right? They're, they're at the front of the field, so I don't want to be too harsh on them. They're leading the, the Drivers' Championship with Max, and they're certainly not in trouble, but there does seem to be a little bit of a, a chaotic background, a little bit of shuffling around, and they may well get that all under control long before 26 comes around. But I think we mentioned it in FP1, there tends to be, if you go back in the history of Formula 1, a period of domination from a team, then a period of rebuilding before they can find a way to get back to the top. We've seen it at McLaren, we've seen it at Mercedes, we've seen it even at Red Bull in the past. I wonder if they're at the end of their period of domination and we might be going into their period of rebuilding and they may well look at missing out on the opportunity of 26. It's all teed up to be rather great. tasty, isn't it? And Formula 1's great as it is right now. Just on the Alpine uh, news as well, there is a little bit coming out about what's going on with the engine programme. Indeed, no decisions have been made yet. And after protests, of course, that we saw out in uh, uh, in Monza for uh, the staff at Viri, uh, Luca Di Meo, uh, the, the big boss at Renault, has now agreed to meet employees uh, at Viri to uh, discuss what is going on there. So that is uh, the latest uh, news around that still no decision made but uh, I think uh, they are weighing up the potential of ditching their Renault engine for Mercedes power and of course we'll have a new driver lineup next year as well Pierre Gasly staying with the team joined by another rookie Jack Dewan so that's what's going down at Alpine who I don't think we've spoken about once until now no, that's right <laughs> and just quickly one last thing on that why 26 is such an opportunity obviously all the big changes speak for themselves but 26 in itself is the big opportunity because after that, as we've seen at every big regulation change in the history of the sport, after that, people start to learn what others are doing. People start to get a, a handle on mistakes they might have made. They start copying each other's car designs. And gradually, from the very point of those rules are being introduced, you gradually start to get a diminishing of the, of the advantage that one team might have. So the big opportunity is in 26. It doesn't mean they all end after that, but that's where the big opportunity is so hitting the ground running in 26 is so important for everybody involved in this sport 
Well, back to the on-track action, and uh, well, we're, we're deep into the, the long running, which is uh, underway on the uh, on the hard and the medium tyre of choice for uh, drivers out there putting in uh, the laps. Uh, Alonso's uh, completed over 10 laps, uh, so to Magnussen still on, actually, uh, the, uh, the soft tyre out there at the moment, so running a little bit out of sync. Uh, Norris completed uh, 13 laps on his set of soft tyres, so uh, the rest are on harder compounds, uh, which are really expected to be the ones that come into play on Sunday for race day, which, as you said earlier, we are expecting uh, to be a one-stop. But, of course, teams may save some sets for the race, particularly now and in qualifying, to cover the eventualities of a potential red flag. Uh, safety cars, which there are well it is technically I'm always wary of saying a 100% chance of a safety car but that is what the statistic said there has been a safety car at least in each of the last five Singapore Grand Prix so uh, that will be something to uh, monitor but interestingly we have not had a safety car in any race this season in the last eight races yeah, that is surprising, isn't it? I mean, even Baku, I mean, we had that massive crash, but it was so close to the end, we were able to finish it just under the, the, the sort of yellow flag. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a surprising stat, isn't it? Particularly with the number of street circuits we go to these days, where that risk is always increased because of the lack of runoff area. And that's, again, the situation here. If you have an accident, there's not really anywhere for the cars and the bits of those cars to go other than back onto the racetrack just getting a couple of replays for us rally style for Lando Norris down to turn one getting caught up behind the Sauber and having to uh, hold that McLaren as he went wide down at turn one indeed Charles Leclerc's having problems trying to get ahead of the other Sauber of Valtteri Bottas couldn't quite find a way down to turn one even with DRS and as soon as you move offline the dirt and the dust that comes out on track and indeed Norris also having to find the escape road and he even having to find reverse trying to get past the Salvers. So uh, the Salvers are proving to be slight roadblocks uh, for the quicker cars out there. Indeed, Joe and Bottas are 19th and 20th uh, with, uh, well, less than four minutes on the clock remaining of free practice two. Yeah. And with that, just less than four minutes, comes to one of my favourite segments, Andrew Benson standing by, which means it's time for this. Long Run Corner with Andrew Benson. You can go the distance well, it's been a really confusing long run corner, I have to say, uh, probably because, mainly because the teams are all using different tyres, pretty much. Uh, normally the strategy at Singapore is to start on the soft for the grip off the line and then manage the tyre to that first stop and then choose whatever you want next for the end of the race. But only Lando Norris of the front runners is using the soft tyre for a race simulation run. He is unsurprisingly the quickest driver um, on that tyre and almost overall on a 1 minute 37.398 average. But slightly quicker than him was the fastest of the medium tyred runners, which was Charles Leclerc, on 37.358. So only four hundredths between those two drivers. So basically, they, oh, they, you can't really compare the long runs because it's on different tyres, it's soft for Norris and the medium for Leclerc. But they've been the sort of two pace setters in the both practice sessions on, on one lap, and now they're the pace setters, pace setters on the long run as well. Max Verstappen, who seems to be struggling, unsurprisingly, um, uh, at this track uh, on the Red Bull um, on one lap, um, is on, on the hard tyre, along with Sergio Perez, his teammate. And they're the only front runners to run the hard tyre on the long runs. And he's done a 1 minute 37.9 average. Uh, behind Leclerc on the medium, it's Lewis Hamilton, believe it or not, uh, about three tenths behind Leclerc, followed by Oscar Piastri's McLaren, then Russell's Mercedes and Carlos Sainz's Ferrari. Thank you very much, Andrew. So, just to follow up on that, Andrew, we, we don't really know where we're at. <laughs> Basically, yeah. That sums it up. I think what we can say, oh, we've got a crash oh. for Mercedes. It's Russell in the wall, Harry. It is indeed. Thanks, Andrew. As uh, Yuki Tsunoda just said, he kissed the wall. George Russell does a little bit more than that and has gone front nose in to the wall. And that is down, I believe, at turn eight. Just as you turn into the right-hander, He's, uh, you can see, uh, we can see, he's uh, put his foot on the brakes because the tyre markings there are heading straight to the wall. Front nose damage there, possibly suspension. He's moving in the car. He's trying to turn the wheel 
back around, but I wonder if he actually can, if it's lodged in the wall slightly, the, the left tyre. Well, I suspect he's waiting. It's a very busy racetrack right now. If he can get it reversed and it's not damaged that suspension, in fact, there he goes, reversing. He's left his entire nose and front wing wedged into the, the barriers, but the rest of the car looks able to drive all the way back round again. So and that means that we're never going to clear those yellow flags because there's still a big piece of, of uh, Russell's car there. We talked so much, didn't we, about confidence. That is not going to help. He ended last year's race from a really strong position in the wall in the closing laps, and he's just done it again. It's going to really dent his confidence, which is what he needs for this weekend. In fact, this was the track that uh, George Russell, it's not one I'm sure he would like to remember, but this was where he took his first ever DNF back in 2019. Here it is then, Russell into the braking zone. Oh, wow. how strange. What a strange So he, he turns it in, all looks well, and then almost midway through the corner, the steering just goes straight. I'm in the wall. That's the uh, front right. Hey, sir. Well, that was what Russell had to say about it, but that it, looked very bizarre. It was a very matter-of-fact uh, relaying of the message, wasn't it? He snatched the front right, he's talking about locking it up there. As soon as you do, it was very slow speed is what made it look so strange, but as soon as you lock a tyre, you effectively have no braking anymore, it's not slowing the car down, it's just sliding across the racetrack, you've got no turning ability anymore. Again, you're just sliding in the direction of the car's travel, and unfortunately, that's exactly what happened. He locked the tyre, he couldn't do anything about it, the momentum just carried it in a straight line straight into the barrier so one of those kind of embarrassingly slow accidents and uh, Colo Pinto and Sonoda are also getting very close in the final stage of the free practice too well drivers clearly pushing to the limits then as the track starts to evolve gets faster all the drivers get more comfortable out on track with where they're at with their cars but as the checkered flag now is out for free practice too Russell well, he was in limp home mode earlier, but that was just a flick of a switch to get that right. It now he very much is in limp home mode with no front wing. Luckily, no damage, it appears, to any of the suspension. He's able to drive that Mercedes in a straight line and has indeed made it back to the pits. But uh, as you alluded to there, Mark, having crashed out from a podium place challenging for the win last time out in Singapore a year ago, that is not one for the confidence as he makes it back into his markings, quick change of tyres, and actually they're struggling to get the, the rest of the nose cone off the front of the car. Well, they're using this because the chequered flag's just come out, so they can't go back out onto the racetrack, but they're using this as practice for a potential nose change if they have to do it in a race. So they're going through the motions of a pit stop you know because this incident could happen in race day so it's not gone well unfortunately but of course that's why you do it in practice to find out what goes wrong and how you overcome it Rosanna you're down there what can you see yeah, Mark is exactly right. So the mechanics were waiting in the pit box with leaf blowers, I think just expecting to receive George Russell in his car and probably that'd be the end of the session for him. And then suddenly there was a mad dash and all the mechanics ran through back to the back of the garage, grabbed their helmets and ran back out. And I looked over the pit wall and Ron Meadows, their sporting director at Mercedes, had turned around and of course he's wired up with the team radio and he would have called practice pit stop and that's why they all ran and grabbed their kit and then they were ready, as Mark said, to do a sort of a practice pit stop but an emergency one to make some changes obviously because that could well happen here in Singapore the walls are close people may well lose front wings or or little bits of the car uh, in the race itself so good practice for Mercedes but not what they want right at the end of FP2 and yeah his um, the, the nose cone completely battered uh, the front of the car so um, an interesting incident for George Russell and one that, that I'm sure review but hopefully they'll be able to just use a new front wing uh, I saw a spare actually it's a shared spare I saw on a stand earlier on so a shared Shared spare, like saying that, uh, for Lewis and George, and I guess George might need to use it. I guess he will. Not the end Mercedes would want for FP2, but they live to fight another day. But that is the chequered flag out as the practice starts for the uh, remainder of the cars out on track get underway. And it's Lando Norris and McLaren who lead the way with a 137. Nothing between himself and Charles Leclerc in the Ferrari. Are we teed up for a McLaren versus Ferrari battle?
battle. Norris versus Leclerc. Perhaps Carlos Sainz is third. Yuki Tsunoda with a strong showing for RB is fourth. Oscar Piastri fifth ahead of Daniel Ricciardo in sixth. Then it's George Russell. Perez, the best of the Red Bulls in eighth. Albon and Hulkenberg, the top ten. Lewis Hamilton struggling continually with the setup of his Mercedes down in 11th ahead of Alonso. Magnussen's 13th. Stroll and Verstappen only down in 15th. The Red Bulls doing their long running. The only ones to do it on the hard tyre. Franco Colapinto is next. Then it's the two Alpines, Ocon and a Gasly. And the two Salvers, Joe Guanyu and Valtteri Bottas. But uh, Rosanna, really hard to actually see where we're at. So, you know, if Andrew Benson doesn't quite know where we're at in the long run corners, then, you know, God help the rest of us. I know. I, I don't know where to go now. If Andrew Benson doesn't know <laughs> the answer, then I might as well just, just leave Singapore and, and head home. <laughs> a head in my hand. Um, I've just watched George Russell's Mercedes being pushed back into his garage by the mechanics. Of course, without the front part of the car, it's quite difficult to reverse it uh, when you're pushing it. So that was quite a, an interesting effort from the mechanics, but they've managed to do it. You can hear the cars lining up on the start finish straight. They're doing some practice starts. We mentioned that in FP1. So important to, to practice that ahead of the Grand Prix on Sunday because it's uh, so important not to lose any places off the start here given how important track position is. I tell you what, it is still hot and humid here uh, and local time, well, it's 10 o'clock just after and it is still incredibly hot. I'm going to go and find a cool drink. I hope you've enjoyed FP1 and FP2. As Harry said, difficult to know who's ahead. We had Charles Leclerc Fasters in FP1 and Lando Norris in FP2. Join us for FP3 tomorrow. We'll be on the website. Thank you to Mark, to Harry. I've been Rosanna Tennant and this has been an IMG production for BBC Radio 5.